Hello everyone, we're back again with another episode of The Fact, the series that discuss international issues. And uh, here we are with you with the seventh episode of the series. Uh, today we want to talk about the uh, issue of sanction on Iran. And as you know, uh, recently Trump has uh, uh, pulled out from the JCPOA and uh, again uh, continued the sanctions on Iran. Today we have two respected guests from uh, Germany and England. We have Mr. Michael Oporskowski from Germany. And also we have Mr. Patrick Henningson from England. I would like uh, actually to welcome both of you to the program and I will be at your service as your host uh, for this episode of The Fact. Uh, if you may, I would like to start with the first question asking from uh, Mr. Henningson. Uh, as you know, Trump uh, decided to pull out from the JCPOA and uh, again we are under sanctions which were suspended for a while and uh, I would like to know about the consequences of such a decision on Iran and on the economy of uh, this country. Sure, uh, thank you Ali. Uh, yeah, the, the, the first thing to, I think, to understand uh, is that this was a complete policy pivot, uh, which came with the new presidential administration uh, that took uh, power in 2017. Uh, the previous administration had uh, worked uh, with the European partners, with the P5 plus one, to uh, establish a very complicated but a working uh, framework. Uh, with regards to the JCPOA, the, uh, what the Americans call the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, and this provided sanctions relief for Iran, uh, which uh, allowed Iran to sort of resume uh, uh, trading and develop relationships and economic uh, commercial interests and things like this that it wasn't able to do previously. Uh, and so then with the Trump administration, uh, all the progress that was made, not just in making the deal, but uh, uh, that Iran being able to reach out to markets globally uh, across all industries, uh, particularly uh, in the technology field, uh, in, in medical technologies, but also, of course, in oil and gas as well, uh, very important uh, for Iran's economy. Uh, and so that all came to a screeching halt uh, just last year. Uh, with the Trump administration announcing uh, harsher sanctions, even harsher, in fact, than before. Uh, so uh, how is this going to affect uh, the Iranian economy? Uh, as, as Iranians know, they're used to being under sanctions. They've adapted to sanctions uh, for the last 20-plus years. And so it's, it, to, I guess, to the average person on the street in uh, Tehran, uh, it's not news to be under sanctions. And they just shrug their shoulders and say, "Well, you know, uh, we're used to it. Uh, we've 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 have to compensate and do things a different way." But I think uh, it's this sanctions that we're under right now with this regime with the United States. This is more uh, much closer to a full embargo uh, than just targeted sanctions. This is what the this government in the, in Washington is moving towards, uh, and this is a, a, a form of economic warfare. Uh, and this is a template that's being applied not just to Iran, but also to Venezuela right now, and Syria as well. Uh, but in the case of Syria, it's joint U.S. and EU sanctions. Uh, and in the case of Russia, again, it's the same. It's joint U.S. and EU sanctions. But with, with Iran, it's, it's more or less unilateral. Um, and Iran would like to trade with its European partners, but uh, it... And the European partners would like to honor the JCPOA deal, but it's the threat of secondary sanctions by the United States basically attacking not just uh, who it perceives to be its enemies, in this case Iran, uh, but also attacking its allies uh, if they choose to do business with Iran or any other country uh, that's uh, attempting to bust sanctions or bypass sanctions. Okay, so what does this mean? It means that... Uh, 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 Iran is not going to be able to 
reach its full potential. So uh, you won't have a growth situation economically in Iran. Uh, maybe you'll have a, a situation where they're holding on and surviving rather than being able to grow and prosper. Uh, and the, the thinking in, the, in Washington is if they apply enough economic pressure on Iran uh, in this way, that somehow the people will, you know, get angry and rise up and overthrow the regime. I mean, this is the sort of standard uh, methodology applied by the U.S., and they'll apply the same methodology towards, uh, towards Venezuela, and they've been doing this with Cuba for, you know, the better part of 50-plus years, uh, and, and it hasn't been successful. Uh, generally, this, this model of sanctions doesn't work in terms of extracting concessions from the target state okay and this is known theory this is grounded academic theory this isn't anything that's uh guesswork a lot of models negotiation models have been devised uh one of the great uh probably american academic experts in this field is daniel dresner who devised a whole series of game theory models with regards to sanctions and if you read uh the work of daniel dresner which was written in 1999 you know 20 years ago uh, it's absolutely accurate and it'll predict uh, pretty much every single move that we see right now. Uh, Iran is not going to uh, give any concessions uh, simply because whenever there's a threat of aggression uh, later, uh, this precludes any concessions by the target state. So if, if the U.S. wants concessions from Iran, it has to stop threatening it militarily. Then there's a potential according to grounded theory, uh, that you can have some dialogue or potential concessions extracted. Um, more likely, the U.S. is going to get concessions from its allies uh, and not its enemies. The reason it's going to get it from its allies is because Britain and the P5 the P plus 1 European partners know they're not going to be uh, attacked militarily by the United States, so they're more likely to acquiesce. This is all grounded uh, proven theory, basically. So the, the U.S. Is do, should be doing this in the full knowledge there will be no concessions from Tehran. So what is this? It's just collective punishment. It's just, uh, in the end, economic warfare designed to weaken the Iranian economy. And my what I've said in the past and what others have said was that, is that this is clearly the, the objective by the U.S. behind this is not to extract concessions from Tehran or to get them to change policy or anything like that. They're accusing them of doing things that they haven't done, like supporting al-Qaeda, for instance. It's ridiculous. The, the, the point is to, um, to, to, to keep Iran from becoming an economic hegemon in the Middle East, from competing with Saudi Arabia, from competing with Qatar, from competing with U.S. allies in the region, uh, competing for influence, for markets, for labor markets, many different things. Uh, and this suits the Gulf states uh, very much, but it also suits Israel as well, uh, because Israel sees Iran as uh, a sponsor of Hezbollah, for instance, therefore as somehow an indirect threat to, to Israel. So uh, again, no, none of this has to do with any expectations of getting any concessions from Tehran. You actually mentioned very interesting points, and uh, it, it makes me to go to the next question, because um, you said collateral damages, and also you have mentioned about the, uh, you know, um, potential um, economic things or economic consequences that might bring uh, or might, uh, might be brought to the country by such, an, uh, such a, you know, sanction. But I would like to ask uh, Mr. Opelskowski about... Uh, about the uh, possibility of isolation of Iran, does this whole thing can uh, actually uh, make Iran isolated in the region or not? Assalamu alaikum, brothers. Um, first of all, I do not think that uh, Iran is isolated or got even more isolated because of those this economic warfare. And because it's a matter of fact, <clears throat> and it can be easily proved um, by the um, by the situation that is uh, those states like Venezuela like uh, the Syria like uh, <clears throat> the resistance forces in Iraq in 
in uh, in Lebanon are even getting closer to Iran than they have been before. And in the contrary, if you read through the uh, articles, through analysis in the so so-called third world, um, there's a growing understanding of the situation in Iran and the real background of the U.S. policy that is threatening not only Iran, but is also threatening other forces who try to have a development towards a more independent policy. In Europe, it's a little bit more complicated because there's a difference between the U.S. strategy towards Iran and the European one. The European one is not very nice because they also, they agree, very much agree with the U.S. Um, regime to organize a regime change, but they have more influence in Iran through economic mechanisms that they have developed over the last decades um, compared to this, uh, the States, but uh, therefore they have to lose also a lot of things. And they're actually losing now. And don't underestimate the role of uh, uh, exile Iranians living in Germany, especially, and Britain, in your country, Patrick, and France. And these so called exile Iranians, they are rotten elements, completely counter revolutionary on the payroll of the, the big and the small side uh, shaitans. Um, so they influence the policy because some of those forces are even now members and members of parliament and members of institutions uh, in the in those countries. Take for example in in Germany you have Iranian or so-called Iranian members of parliament within the different pa uh, political parties and they're hardliners concerning the policy towards Iran and they are part and parcel of the strategy against Iran. So you have the differences between Europe and the United States. And th these differences create also a, an atmosphere among some um, economic circles in Europe, especially also in Germany, and they are loudly expressing these positions in some papers, newspapers, they criticize the U.S. policy towards that direction. But um, if you come back to the bottom of the line, the bottom of the line simply is that Iran is not getting isolated and uh, this policy is getting uh, to strengthen Iran in the long-term run if decisions are taken that are on the table but not yet fully taken by the Iranian politicians to join those forces internationally like uh, China and Russia who are already building up alternative um, um, an alternative system to the economic structures com dominated by the West and especially by United States and especially on the financial structures uh, which are controlled by the US. Well, um you actually mentioned about the uh, uh, differences in Europe and also differences of, you know, Iranian exiles in, in Europe and, uh, you know, in different countries. Um, I would like to know if uh, these kind of, uh, you know, uh, different situation in your, in, especially in Europe, can affect uh, public opinion about concerning, uh, especially concerning the uh, sanctions on Iran. And I would like to know if people would consider such sanctions uh, uh, on Iran as something fair or not. Actually, I'm um, addressing uh, our friend Patrick, and uh, uh, so I would like to know if this whole situation can be seen as something fair on the ideas of people or on, on the, uh, actually, uh, opinion of people. Yeah, uh, I, th I think, I think, and I can speak I can speak for the American side uh, and also for the European side. The, the, de the demonization campaign of Iran and Iranians and the Iranian government, etc., it's, it's, it's much more intense and ramped up and a daily campaign uh, in the United States. So 
that's to condition the American public not to feel any sympathy whatsoever uh, for Iran or Iranians. And the general psychology in America is to uh, blame the people for not overthrowing uh, the government. This was the general psychology that was used in the uh, in ahead of the Iraq war, which was that why don't the people rise up and overthrow Saddam Hussein? And, and if they didn't, they sort of, you know, subconsciously deserve, uh, you know, what they got in terms of uh, intervention. And we're sorry, but, you know, you should have you should have rose up and overthrown the evil dictator. Um, that's a, that's the kind of the deep psychology behind the kind of neoconservative interventionist thinking, but also the neoliberal interventionist thinking as well. They've applied that to Syria uh, for the last eight years. But in Europe, it's not as intense. In Europe, uh, there's definitely a stronger case to be made uh, for trading. You know, what, what a company like Peugeot could uh, lose uh, in terms of business in Iran is significant, whereas that's a drop in the bucket in terms of the U.S. GDP, although the United States did uh, turn down a major deal with Boeing aircraft. Uh, I, the Iranian uh, air, air carrier wanted to refit its whole fleet, uh, and that would have given 100,000 jobs to Boeing in Seattle and some of its other plants around the United States. But because of the power of the Israeli lobby, for one, uh, and also the power, the new power of the Gulf lobby uh, as well, uh, and just the general demonization of Iran uh, across the board, uh, make, made this actually to say no to uh, a major contract like this and to sort of press for uh, uh, renewing sanctions uh, and completely withdrawing from the JCPO de a deal. The, 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 the two main factors are um, America has a much more stake uh, in the Iranian issue uh, because the U.S. can project power. Uh, and they can use the situation in Iran to demonstrate that they can not not just project military power, but project financial power. Uh, and Michael uh, alluded to this, talking about the dollar mechanisms that dominate the world financial system. And that, in the end, is the power of the United States. The United States can pull back its aircraft carriers. It can take its tanks out of Iraq, but the dollars remain in the central banks. And, and, it, and they, re, they maintain control of the SWIFT system, for instance, the payment system, which is based in, uh, in Brussels. Now, SWIFT did, wanted to uh, take the side of the EU and Frederica Margarini uh, and sort of uh, facilitate a special purpose vehicle for bypassing U.S. sanctions to trade with Iran, to honor the JCPO agreement. And the United States threatened to sanction SWIFT itself. To, to actually physically sanction the organization. SWIFT got afraid and scared. They caved in. They could have easily taken the case politically uh, to the European courts, uh, to, the, to Brussels itself, but that shows you how weak Brussels is in terms of foreign policy. The EU is an economic power in terms of its trading zone, but it doesn't have the muscle foreign policy-wise, uh, whereas the individual member states uh, in Europe they actually have maybe more leverage uh, than Brussels itself does in terms of, you know, countering the United States. But uh, that only leaves Britain, Germany, and France really as two, the three main partners, and, and mainly the UN Security Council members, uh, France and, and Britain, in that respect. And they're not going to really seriously challenge the U.S. on this at all. Um, so, but it is about dollar domination. That it's it, this is the way the U.S. can project and maintain. Uh, their top position uh, in terms of their grand strategy for the next 100 years is to use economic warfare. And that's exactly what this president is doing. Uh, and they're tr trying to do this to maximum effect uh, because Donald Trump, uh, like other presidents, knows that uh, U.S. direct military intervention in any country now at the moment is very politically untenable. So they either have to uh, fund proxies uh, to carry out their objectives or to find local uh, partners to uh, carry out their objectives as they have done with Saudi Arabia and Yemen. This is a perfect example of a local partner uh, doing the U.S. bidding uh, geopolitically or and its partners. But uh, aside from that, being able to pure economic power, and this is done through the dollar mechanism. And, and Brussels is struggling to find a way to bypass 
uh, the United States dollar uh, with doing business directly with Iran because of this. The dollar is so prevalent uh, globally as a, as a reserve currency, as a liquid form of exchange. Um, it's, 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 uh, it's the lifeblood of the global economy, uh, whether you like it or not. However, Michael also mentioned, which is true, that alternative trading mechanisms and relationships, and there are infrastructures being worked on and built now, but they're still down the road. It's still going to be a few years. Uh, there's clearing mechanisms between China and Russia, uh, that uh, a, a rival to the SWIFT payment system, for instance, um, that will have probably eventually come online. And it will come online as a direct result of these sanctions. And this uh, behavior by the United States is going to force uh, alternative uh, economic infrastructure systems uh, between countries that want to continue trading but, but can't at the moment. So this is the problem. Iran fi finds itself in a gap right now, uh, a gap in time before alternative payment structures and infrastructures are, 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 are built and can work and there's enough people that will get on board with them uh, to make them viable and, and, and the status quo right now, which is a dollar-dominated uh, economy. So the United States is hoping to manipulate countries like Iran in this gap period uh, to try to force regime change, for instance, um, and also to keep them out of the market. Here's the last thing I'll say. This is a, a, a supply and demand issue with global oil, okay? By, by keeping Iran from uh, earning the money that it would use to reinvest in its uh, oil and gas industry, okay? And not just oil and gas, all of its other energy technologies, including nuclear, okay? By, by doing that, uh, what they're doing, uh, it, it just on oil and gas, keeping that supply, uh, that, that production capacity off the market, it means that other countries, uh, people say it's about oil, the war's about oil. Um, with Iraq, with Libya, with Venezuela, with Iran, it's, it's about not taking Iran's oil, but keeping Iran from producing uh, a sufficient quality that it would make a worthwhile profit and help the overall standard in the country. But Saudi Arabia and the United States will pick up the supply for any country that's a major producer that's not producing to capacity. Venezuela is a good a good example. Okay, Iraq has picked up uh, a, a fair share as well, uh, but the United States could easily throw sanctions on Iraq if it if it so choose to in the future, uh, and if it did so, the U.S. would pick up the slack in production, and that's profit for U.S. companies. If Saudi Arabia picks up the slack, that's profit for Aramco. Um, so the, the the production capacity is there for the U.S. In Saudi Arabia, so then they just knock off people out of the market, and they'll pick up the uh, the, the production, and they'll they'll reap the benefit from that, while other countries suffer from not being able to to meet the market demand, because there's a there's a a, a supply sharing agreement between OPEC countries, uh, and there's other countries that are uh, tertiary uh, members like Russia, for instance, who aren't uh, officially an OPEC member, but uh, are cooperating in some ways uh, in terms of price with OPEC. But Russia would also benefit uh, from this gap in supply. But with sanctions on Russia, uh, what the U.S. is trying to do is corner the market uh, for itself and its major partners so that they can, in, a, in effect, control and, and maximize their profits in terms of oil and gas. Um, so that's, a, that's an added benefit to this particular policy. Okay, but this is disaster capitalism at the end of the day. It's, it's not a viable long-term strategy at all for the U.S. Uh, well, it is uh, very interesting because you mentioned domination of dollar, which also, uh, you know, was uh, the, the same thing happened in Libya. I mean, in other countries, they, they tried to actually to empower dollar and they tried to uh, fight any kind of other currency uh, coming in front of the dollar. We are actually uh, witnessing the same issue in, uh, in Iran. Um, as you know, uh, Riyal or uh, Tuman in Iran has lost uh, lots of its power and value uh, comparing to dollar. And uh, some say that it is due to uh, problems within the government in, in, in Iran. It is due to domestic issues. 
and some say it is due to sanctions which is done by uh, USA. I would like to ask uh, Mr. Oparskalski about uh, the, the same point uh, to see if it is um, either on domestic uh, issues or on uh, US. First of all, as I see it, the most dominant factor are the sanctions, which is economic warfare, which is embargo. But of course, there are some domestic questions which uh, fuel uh, willingly or unwillingly the, um, the uh, questions that are imported from abroad through san san sanctions and through uh, embargo policies. Because, you know, if you, for example, play with the idea that Europe, uh, and especially Germany and France, would uh, fill the gap, then you're playing with fire, and you're losing time, um, which could uh, be used for looking for alternative options. And uh, they are there, they are complicated, they take time, no question, but Europe is in no-go uh, situation, because whatever the Europeans think about, alternative forms of payment, uh, alternative forms of economic relations, they, they link it with a very strict condition way of sellout. So um, it is like uh, the, the decision between the, the two devils, and um, this is not a good situation. So, therefore, I see the uh, foreign uh, question uh, through embargo and sanctions and economic warfare and the domestic, some domestic aspects which are linked to uh, not full, fully concentrating on alternative um, mechanisms, which of course uh, needs time they need uh, education, don't underestimate the question of education, because it's a, it is a problem that uh, too much uh, pro-Western uh, thinking within certain circles uh, was uh, over the years educated, um, in contrast to the possibility of uh, working uh, with other regions, um, China, Russia, Africa, Middle East, etc. So we have the combination of the two factors, as I see it. Thank you so very much. Uh, it is uh, uh, something that also uh, I need to say that as sometimes people say in, uh, in Iran, the corruption that might be seen in some parts of the government might also affect this kind of, uh, you know, crisis with, uh, about real and uh, dollar. And some would try to totally ignore the effect of, of sanctions and will totally focus on domestic issues, saying that it is only because of the uh, domestic problems, focusing on the, um, you know, corruption that might be um, existing in the government. So, do you think uh, basically it is correct or not to, to say that it is due to corruption? Look, uh, uh, if you go to Germany, let's talk about uh, the country I have to live in, uh, the, the question of corruption is a very, very crucial one. So, somebody who is talking about corruption in, in Iran neglects the fact that corruption is a method of the present capitalist system and this capitalist system is producing corruption as a basic uh, rule for so-called progress and just progress for a few, not for the masses. So, definitely, if you, you will find some kind of corruption and in Iran, no question, uh, and if you really analyze some of those uh, cases, uh, it is linked to pro-Western or Western-oriented uh, people who deal, try to deal with the France, with the Britain, etc., and they try to take some buy cash, cash here and there, and they open their pocket. And I personally have met people in Iran 
who are openly um, with German companies, for example, but oh, not for the benefit of uh, Iran, but for the benefit of their own uh, pocket. This exists, no question. And somebody who would ignore it, um, I think uh, it's not serious. But never, 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 never um, underestimate the dominant, completely dominant factor which is really hampering the economic situation in Iran and it will, for example, continue to, uh, to, to, to support the decline of the Iranian currency, that is the um, embargo, the economic warfare and the, the, the sanctions and this is done and executed by all Western countries and of course mainly also by the big Satan, by the US. Perfect, thank you. Uh, well, uh, Patrick, you uh, perfectly mentioned the, uh, you know, oil crisis. That is, is something which is the reason of all of these kind of, you know, wars or crises or, you know, uh, protests either in, in Venezuela or uh, previously in Libya. And also now uh, we have the crisis in Iran. So, uh, concerning this issue, I would like to know if uh, if Iran has to or will uh, decrease its oil, um, uh, you know, production or not? And do you think in future we will see that um, it will it will decrease to zero or not? Problems facing Iran with regards to uh, fulfilling the potential of its oil and gas industry. One is it's probably uh, 20 to 30 years behind in terms of reinvestment. Uh, in the infrastructure, not just uh, in the kind of oil production side, but also in the oil refinery uh, business as well. Um, this is also a big part of it. Um, so at the, at the moment, uh, there's a good trade between Iraq uh, and Iran with regards to, uh, so I, I, Iraq is also pre performing some refinery uh, uh, work for, for Iran as well and vice versa, uh, power uh, is being supplied uh, between the two countries as well. Um, so, but there's, there's, there's the infrastructure issue and to, to, to reinvest in your infrastructure, this is the problem Venezuela is having, um, is you can't do this without cash. You need cash. When the, when the price of oil collapsed, uh, the, the, the oil collapsed price between, let's say, uh, you know, 2013 and 2017, you had a sort of a collapse in the global price of oil that killed uh, Venezuela's ability to uh, reinvest and basically upgrade to keep it up to, uh, you know, up to date, basically. Uh, and with Iran as well, they haven't had the, so what do they need? Direct foreign investment. Where does this come from? It can only come from signing deals with Western uh, companies like Shell or BP or, or whoever, Aram, uh, uh, Arco, or whoever, Texaco, whoever's got the money to be able to uh, deliver. And the biggest buyer, the biggest clients for Iran, but not just Iran, for the whole Middle East, it's not the United States uh, or North America, uh, because they're more or less energy sufficient uh, between the US and Canada with regards to, to oil, for instance, uh, oil and gas. It's China, China, Japan, South, uh, South Korea, uh, these are the biggest clients uh, for Middle Eastern uh, uh, energy. And so the, and th that's Iran's a major uh, supplier there. So uh, th that's is it going to be able to meet the demand? There's there's money to be made for Iran for China. And why is this important? Because the, the profits made from from oil sales go into social services. They can meet the balance of payments, the day to day balance of payments that the Iranian government has to deliver basic services, to upgrade infrastructure, um, uh, to upgrade its ports for more trade, to upgrade its fleets, uh, uh, naval fleets for merchant merchant navy, uh, its airlines, and so forth. All the things that, and other quality of life issues, you know, uh, uh, the water, uh, civilian water treatment facilities, uh, the nuclear power industry as well. That will be financed from oil revenues um, as well. All of these modernization uh, projects that, uh, so when, when this is not happening, 
uh, when there is a deficit in the balance of payments, when the local currency is, is also suffering from hyperinflation um, uh, because of a liquidity crisis, all of these things put pressure on the government. Uh, and all of these things, then any corruption that does exist gets amplified 10 times because there's not general prosperity all around. Um, so the, the education system is not being uh, reinvested in. Although Iran has an excellent education system, maybe the best, one of the best uh, in the region uh, and the highest skilled labor uh, force in the region, perhaps. Okay, But uh, it's, not, it's not a world leader where it probably should be. In a normal non-sanctioned environment, Iran would be a world leader uh, in probably a number of technology fields, definitely in the medical uh, in industry, definitely in the pharmaceutical industry, perhaps even uh, in other areas, uh, in, even maybe in aerospace, challenging uh, for markets there as well. Uh, so it, it's not reaching this potential. This must be greatly frustrating to uh, Iran Iranians uh, as well. And sometimes people will project this frustration on the government when, in fact, uh, they you know they're 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 cut off from large sections of the global economy, uh, which is going to have an effect. Um, and in the attack on the currency is probably the the biggest target. And that that was the case in Syria. This is a case in Iran, uh, where these countries won't have large gold reserves because they've already sold off their gold reserves in the past in order to just get from A to B, from crisis to crisis. Um, so this is the case with Syria. I, I don't know about Iran's per capita gold reserves at the moment, but I wouldn't imagine they're very high. Uh, but there is also a gold trade between Turkey and Turkey's acting as a, a conduit for uh, uh, some sales for things like this. Um, but that's that's not probably where Iran wants to be. Um, so, but if Iran was able to meet meet its economic potential with economic power comes political power. It, you then can project not just economic influence, you project political influence in the region. This is why it is a priority of the United States to uh, uh, hurt and to keep down the, the Iranian economy as much as possible. Uh, because if it's able to fully project its political and economic influence, then you would have a very different situation in Lebanon, probably. Uh, very different situation in Syria and Iraq. And you have a potential of an economic zone from Lebanon, from the Mediterranean uh, to, to Iran that's quite a powerful economic and political zone as well. And this would totally transform the geopolitics of uh, the Middle East and Asia and the whole MENA region and maybe Europe as well, maybe the world. So um, and so. Some yeah. Final, if you, in case you want to give any kind of final solution for this whole crisis that Iran is dealing with, uh, because you mentioned that actually hurting Iran economically will actually end up in hurting uh, Iran in strategic, you know, uh, aspects. So I would like to know if you uh, want to suggest or if you have any uh, special suggestion about the solution. Uh, of uh, such an you know uh, such a crisis in Iran uh, concerning sanctions or not uh, just the, the last thing I'll say is um, I, I I don't think that there is there is a, a direct solution in the short term um, is so so long as it's a dollar dominated um, international reserve currency system um, uh, Iran's not going to be able to bypass the embargo um, fully. And so it's it, it's just going to have to uh, the solution is just to continue working hard to develop uh, good relations and uh, and somehow trade relations with uh, China. Iran is a key part of China's Belt and Road Initiative. Iran is the bridge uh, between Central Asia uh, and Europe, essentially um, on the on the land side of the Belt and Road project. Um, so and and Iran will cap could. Uh, take full advantage of this um, if it was not restrained, okay? And, uh, and and other European countries would profit greatly from trade with Iran, um, Germany being one of them, okay? Germany stands to, to benefit from the Chinese Belt and Road Project probably more than any other European country because uh, it has a, the, probably the best technological industrial base 
of any European country. So it stands ready to benefit. And I bet if you ask, you know, probably Michael could uh, answer this question better than anybody, but the average German uh, would see too many uh, reasons uh, to have uh, open and healthy trade relations and political relations with a country like Iran uh, rather than what's being said in Washington at the moment. So, but uh, I'm afraid I don't have a, uh, an easy solution other than to try to work hard to wait until alternative uh, financial uh, infrastructures are constructed and, and functional. Then you'll see a real multipolar uh, world emerging. Uh, I would like to ask the last question from uh, uh, Michael concerning the future of this whole struggle that Iran has uh, against USA, either concerning, uh, you know, geopolitical uh, events in the Middle East or either on sanctions. How do you think the future will be um, between Iran and USA? <laughs> Uh, support uh, Patrick saying that it is really it would be necessary to stick on very much the um, proposals developed by the Chinese government and the road and um, <clears throat> belt uh, project and um, in a joint measure uh, in a joint operation together with the Iraqi brothers with the Libyan, with the uh, Lebanese brothers and the Syrian brothers. The Syrian bro bro brothers uh, play now a very important role in Beijing at this international conference that is going on these days. But um, there also I think it is really a, um, a middle and long term perspective. But you have to start now. If you wait and wait and see, and try to use the tricky things with the, some Europeans, etc., etc., you lose even more time. Um, so I think what is going to happen now is that um, more and uh, more snaky uh, economic warfare is going to come because by all means the Americans, they don't want, uh, or the North Americans better to say, we shall not include the Latin Americans uh, who are part of America, but uh, they are the victims of, of Washington. So the uh, Washington regime, they don't want really to Iran to prosper, not at all. They want a puppet regime. They can, uh, they really can uh, suck everything out of it, like it was the as during the defunct Shah time. Um, so this is the key. Yeah, therefore, I do not see any any really serious possibility of uh, of uh, improving relations with the with the, the United States regime. But what be what be very important is to develop the relationship with the popular organizations in North America, because uh, this is a key question that to develop uh, through alternative media through if possible, personal relations here and there. Uh, this kind of scenarios, what we are doing now here, the discussion tables, um, to develop an alternative uh, culture of information against uh, the uh, Shaitana Buzorg, the big Satan, and their media. I think it's a variety of alternatives. And uh, if we come back to Europe, um, I do see a potential of growing understanding for not only the situation in Iran, but also because it's very similar to Syria, to, um, to Venezuela, etc. The only problem in, Euro in Germany here is the strong presence on all levels of society, of uh, um, so-called Iranian exiles who are completely hostile to their to their country and even Takfiri official structures uh, they really create problems for um, within the media etc for people ordinary people here in Germany to develop a more understand more better understanding 
but uh, therefore the ball is in my basket as a journalist in Germany to try to do my level best to um, develop this kind of understanding. But uh, it is really a question of orientation, clear orientation, no you know, running around like this. And as uh, our beloved brother Sayyid Hassan said, Mokawa ma Mukawa ma Mukawa, resistance. This is the way out of it. Brilliant. Thank you so very much. Um, actually, I asked all the questions in case uh, either of you respected guests uh, would like to add anything to the subject. I will be at the same. There's one thing I would like to add. Patrick? Because of my experiences that uh, Iran is a is a is a country with a history of thousands of years and culture and a variety of things uh, you know when in europe the people were really <laughs> living in the jungle uh, iran was much more developed on all levels of society and to portray this kind of uh, history history and not let the enemy and I call the so-called Iranian exiles enemy forces, not friendly, and do this. It should be done through this level to start the, a growing understanding within the people in, the, in Germany and Europe in general to build up uh, more bridges between uh, Iran, Iranians and Europeans, inshallah. Hopefully. Thank you so very much. I think you want to add anything? Iran and the world, it's very important. And I think uh, I think Iran has made m very big gains in this area, uh, especially in the last few years. Um, you, you only have to look at uh, some of the media uh, output recently. Uh, certainly press TV is also important in uh, projecting Iran's voice to the English-speaking world. Uh, internationally, that's one example. Uh, the uh, former foreign minister uh, Zarif uh, is also very uh, successful in his media strategy uh, in sort of putting the Western politic political positions in a corner, um, using uh, the tools that are available uh, to maximum effect in order to uh, reframe uh, uh, the Iranian political position in, in, in the Western, for the Western audience and for politicians and done really well uh, doing this. Uh, so yeah, and along with alternative media and so forth uh, and uh, projects like this, I think are very important. Uh, this, is, this is going to pay dividends, I think, uh, in the future. Uh, but it's also, it's also going to uh, make it more difficult to um, isolate uh, Iran politically uh, because if you have a voice and you're able to communicate your position and you do it in an artic articulate way uh, that makes sense to people around the world, uh, it's going to be more difficult to demonize you. And I think that's the United States is struggling to keep the demonization campaign going. They've run out of things. <laughs> they're running out of uh, narratives, as they say. Uh, and, and, and you can see that with uh, Secretary Pompeo. John Bolton making up stories about 9/11, and so forth. And so this is total desperation. This this shows you that they're at the end of their narrative, uh, their 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 basket of narratives. There's nothing left. They're digging out on the bottom now, making things up. And uh, and I think a lot of that's down to Iran's success uh, in communicating um, what what it what its priorities are and what its values are internationally. Thank you so very much. Uh, hereby, I would like to uh, put an end to this episode of our program. It was truly an informative and amazing talk with both of you, Michael and also Patrick. I'm really thankful to both of you for uh, joining our program, and uh, hopefully we will have you again on the, uh, on the fact uh, on next episode. And uh, for our viewers and listeners, I would like to say that you can actually follow our um, program on our YouTube channel. Thank you, again. Thank you everyone. Um, I hope. Yep. Thank you. Goodbye.